Hey there, everybody. It's Sam. In case you haven't heard, season four of SciShow Tangents ended last week, and we're taking this week off. Next week, you can look forward to our season five premiere featuring special guest Maddie Sophia. But for now, please enjoy this beloved classic episode about weather. See you next week. Welcome to SciShow Tangents. It's the lightly competitive knowledge showcase starring some of the geniuses that make the YouTube series SciShow happen, or or just some regular folk who are friends with each other. <laughs> <laughs> this week, as always, as sometimes, I am joined by Sam Schultz. Hello. What's the most satisfying size of battery? Oh, you know what? I can't stand AAA batteries. Yeah. I hate yeah. those. Anything bigger than a AAA, and actually watch batteries too. I I like them all except a AAA. That's such a bad <laughs> size for some reason. It's weird. I think about that all the time. <laughs> Finally found something that you're actually passionate <laughs> yeah. about with my question. <laughs> I figure if I get weirder and weirder, I will locate more Things that Sam cares a lot about. Have you licked a, a D battery? That, that's why that one's my favorite. The nine volts, not the D battery. Nine volt. Uh, yeah, you're right. The square, square one. Ones. I want to really bad, but I'm scared. Oh, does it's it hurt? Just like, no. I've done it. My guitar uses them. And so like during shows, you have to make oh. sure the battery is charged and you can tell by licking it. Is that why you guys are so smart? <laughs> Because we charge our brains yeah. with batteries. Yeah, we're battery lickers <laughs> over here. Uh, and what's your tagline? Uh, exploring the idea of podcasting from bed. I do sometimes podcast from bed for for my podcast I have with my wife. Mm-hmm. And it is not unpleasant. I will say that. <laughs> Sari Riley is also my other co-host for the day. Hello, Sari. Hello. Do you have any idea why there is a large taxidermied squirrel in the parking lot of our office building? <laughs> I have not been to our office building in months. How large? I would say that it, if it were a if it were a live squirrel, it would weigh four times more than a than a fox squirrel, and it's it's mounted to a piece of driftwood. Could be a trap. <laughs> yeah. it, it's probably like a giant <laughs> ruse set out to catch you specifically. One of the scientists we invited for an interview like left out a squirrel as right. a social psychology experiment. <laughs> How long will uh-huh. it take for these nerds to bring in a taxidermy squirrel into their office? Yeah, it's a tro- Trojan squirrel. Yeah. <laughs> What's your tagline? Conspiracy of snakes. And I'm Hank Green, and my tagline is, Printers be damned! Take off the hat! Every week here on Tangents, we are trying to one-up, amaze, and delight each other with science facts. And we're also trying to stay on topic, but we're not going to, even though we're trying. We're also going to play for glory, but we are also awarding chin coins from week to week (laughs) because we need to keep track of who is winning and who is not so that we can feel bad or good about (laughs) ourselves. Just as last week, we're ringing in the new season by trying out some new games. So each week in January, one of us is bring a new game for the show. If we like it enough, might put it into our regular rotation. And I can't wait to see what serious mystery game is. But first, we're going to introduce this week's topic with the traditional science poem this week from Sari. All I'm going to say is shanties are in right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There once was a forest (gasps) of old birch trees Struck by lightning for all to see The rain welled up, the leaves swirled round Oh, blow my bully boys, blow Soon may the weatherman come To bring us a forecast (laughs) of this region One day when the thunder is done We'll take our leave and go She had not been two weeks in spring When down on her the clouds did bring The hail and ice and wind did sting Her face with all that snow Soon oh my God. may the weatherman come to bring us a forecast of this region. One day when the blizzard is done, we'll take our leave and go. And then the summer days get hotter, the sun beats down and we're chugging water. Turn up the fan, I'm glad we bought her before the sky did glow. Soon may the weatherman come to bring us a forecast of this region. One day when the heat is done, we'll take our leave and go. Thank you. Holy crap. (laughs) You need more than one point. We have established that parody songs get more than one point. Oh, we also established that the poems Poems don't get points anymore. Yeah. Oh, poems don't. Oh, fuck. I went all out for (laughs) For uh, just to scare myself. You know, you got to feel alive during a pandemic sometimes. (laughs) Yeah. I hope by the time this episode comes out, sea shanties are still a thing. But I also (laughs) hope by the time 
Uh, this episode has been out for four years that sea shanties are still a big part of popular sure. culture because it is the main thing that I have ha- have like just had so much joy brought into my life by. So thank you for doing a sea shanty cover. And the topic for our day is not just weather men, but also just the weather yeah. in general. Mm-hmm. So, Sari, what is weather? <laughs> well, weather is all kinds of events that happen in the Earth's atmosphere usually in the uh, troposphere, which is the part of the Earth's atmosphere that is closest to the surface and um, under the most air pressure, just from like other atmosphere squishing down on it and being pulled down because of gravity. And it can be temperature and wind and humidity and storms and all the, all that stuff. If you point outside and are like, look mm. at that, uh, that's the weather. <laughs> <laughs> mm. How does wind work? That's air pressure. You can think of high pressure as when molecules are crammed close together, so like mm-hmm. a crowded room. And you can think of low pressure as when things are more far apart, so like everyone has an is an arm's distance, is six feet away from everyone else, hypothetically. Mm-hmm. And naturally, to balance out, to like reach an equilibrium, things move from high pressure zones to low pressure zones. So they move from the more crowded areas to the less crowded areas. And so Air moves from high pressure zones to low pressure zones, and that movement of air is wind. Do you know where the word weather came from? I do. It comes um, from so Carl seems- Weathers. <laughs> he invented it. <laughs> Wasn't around until like the 70s. I don't know who Carl Weathers is. Who is he? He's an actor. He is in Predator. He's the strong guy who's not Arnold Schwarzenegger when they do the cool mm-hmm. arm wrestling thing. The meme. Yeah, the meme. He's the other yeah. guy in the meme. <laughs> He's the yeah. other meme <laughs> arm. Okay. It could have been him if he's a time traveler. The The root word is we or we. I don't know how to say it, but it's spelled W-E, which means to blow. Huh. Thematic with the shanty. And then that changed into Proto-Indo-European Wedro. And then mm. it got passed around Europe as like wetter or wetar or wetter to mean like a storm or wind. But then weather in general. I couldn't find like when we started to differentiate or I couldn't find any separate words for good weather and mm. like storm or bad weather, but in ancient Greece at least they they used weather to describe like inclement storms mm-hmm. and bad things happening, mm. but sunny weather, like calm weather was a different word and then at some point we mushed them all together. Or like you didn't need that yeah. word. This is like that's that's normal. It just yeah. is outside. All right, Sari. Well, it is also now you're going to continue. It's going to be all you. This is the Sari episode of Tangents because now it's time for you to share with us your mystery game. Okay. I just have written in all caps. Hello, this is Brainstorm. So that's the name of my game. It's okay. Brainstorm. Here's how it works. I will give a prompt and the number of answers I have on my list. And you'll have one minute as a team to guess them with no penalties for wrong answers. You both get points equal to the number of correct answers you guessed, and I get points equal to the number of unguessed correct answers. Okay. So, for example, a prompt might be, Kool-Aid was invented in 1927 when a man named Edward Perkins figured out how to make a powdered juice concentrate as an alternative to the liquid concentrates available at the time. The question is, what were the six original flavors of Kool-Aid? You have a minute to guess, and if you guessed after that minute, grape and cherry, you would both get two points, and I would get four points for the remaining four flavors. But Mm. if you guessed grape, cherry, orange, root beer, lemon lime, and raspberry, you both would get six points, and I am doing not so great with zero points. I would not. (laughs) No, I've got root beer. beer. Root beer, cool, eh? That's an advanced flavor. Apparently, they had it figured out right there at the beginning. (laughs) Yeah, what? How, how have we moved backward <laughs> so substantially from root beer cool? What I want is some very flat root beer. Yeah. Question number one. We learn basic types of precipitation in school, like snow, rain, or hail. But sometimes yeah. animals can get sucked up into the sky by extreme oh. weather phenomena <laughs> like tornadoes and water spouts, which are just tornadoes over water, and then fall back out like it's literally raining cats and dogs. What are... Three kinds of animals that have been well documented to fall out of the sky, kind of like precipitation. Ready, set, go. Fish. Yes. Obviously. <laughs> frogs. Yes, also frogs. Shoot, what's the last one? I don't know. What other kind of... Mm, no wrong answer penalties, so you can just keep 
going. Lizards. Nope. Uh, birds. No. Okay. Jellyfish. No. Oh. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, 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 rabbits. No, but good thought. Uh, mice. No. Mm-hmm. Also good thought. Rats. No. Hmm. Is it a rodent? No. Is it a mammal? No. Oh, well, why did you say good so, thought? Oh, okay. <laughs> Just like you were getting smaller. Lizards feel like you were getting, like, slowly getting bigger and then chickens. There's all sides of lizards. I don't think anybody said chickens. Is the answer chickens? Oh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> the last answer, or the final one, was worms. Ah. Earthworms. Oh, okay. When did worms fall out of the sky? It's happened a couple times. It's happened in the United States a few times. A big one was 2015 in Norway, where... Uh, a scientist found thousands of earthworms on the surface of the snow and they thought or they thought that the worms were dead mm. but when he put them in his hand he found that, that they were alive and so he assumed that they got sucked up out of mud somewhere and then just dumped on the snowy earth did i make up that there was once a a shower of raw meat there was a shower of raw meat somewhere i think somewhere in the united states it was called the kentucky meat shower everyone <laughs> some small chunks of red meat Landed near Rankin in Bath County, Kentucky. And we're not sure how it happened, but the most popular theory is the vulture theory. A group of vultures regurgitated their meals. Oh. So that's not that's not weather related. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's vomit out of the sky. Anyone could do that. <laughs> no weather involved. Because you got fish and frogs, you get two points each. And because you missed worms of the three answers, I mm. get one point. Okay, I like this game. Yeah. Question number two. It's really important to monitor weather before flying a plane. So in the U.S., there are these things operated by the Federal Aviation Administration called AWOS or AWOS, maybe, units, which stands for Automated Weather Observing Systems. The latest and greatest specs I could find are for AWOS 4, which measures both general atmospheric things and specific dangers that plane pilots might want to know about because they could delay takeoff or require some maintenance on the plane. So... What are eight distinct types of things that automated weather observing systems measure? Ready? Go. Temperature. Yes. Wind speed? Yes. Humidity? No. Wind <gasps> direction. Does that count as a uh, I lumped that with wind speed in oh, gusts and direction. Oh, please. <laughs> uh, precipitation? Yes. Yeah. Precipitation type and amount I lumped into one. Okay. There's like a billion more. What does the sky do? It um. <laughs> Think about planes. What do oh. they need to know? Okay, I'm thinking about them, and it's not helping me at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, height of something. H- Hank, you go. Height of a uh, fog. Yeah, visibility oh, fog. or cloud height. Visibility. Oh, okay. Good job. <laughs> Four more. Mm, okay. Some kind of turbulence time. related. Oh shit. <laughs> oh, time. Were birds? Was birds one of them? Birds is not one of them. <laughs> oh, that would have been good. <laughs> good guess. So the uh, the remaining ones were barometric pressure. Oh, uh, duh. Lightning or like extreme storms, oh, which okay. is separate from precipitation. Mm-hmm. Ice or freezing rain, and runway surface conditions, which surprised me. Right, because it could it could be clear now, but it could still be wet. Mm-hmm. Yes. I wouldn't have got that last one. Pressure, I feel like a total jackass. Yeah. For mm-hmm. That's like what weather is, is my understanding at this <laughs> yeah, point. Yeah, we just talked about <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. You're still just barely winning. You got four, uh, and then there are four that you didn't get. So we okay. both got four, or we all got four points that round. Question number three. Weather modification has had its ups and downs in history, but one thing that countries have consistently tried is cloud seeding. Water vapor naturally condenses on dust particles or tiny bacteria, collectively called condensation nuclei, to form clouds. So cloud seeding involves spreading condensation nuclei, like silver iodide or even dry ice, to make clouds, usually for two purposes. One is to fight off drought, or one is to use up the water vapor so there's clear weather in days ahead. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Some countries have experimented once or twice in particularly dire weather situations or have patchwork regional organizations, but I have narrowed down a list of 10 countries that have had well-established cloud seeding programs for years or even decades. What are those 10 countries? Ready? Go. Russia. Yes. China. Yes. The United States of America. Yes. We do? Oh. England gets lots of rain, so not them. South Africa. No. 
Hmm. Canada? Yes, Canada. Argentina. Not Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The United the United Kingdom. I'm gonna try. No, it. Not the UK. They get a lot of rain, Hank. Come on. <laughs> well, but maybe they want to clear it up. Oh, yeah. There was another so. reason. Oh, okay. Um the the United Arab Emirates. Yeah. Good job, Sam. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. I guess that makes sense. <laughs> Saudi Arabia. No. Uh, uh do we have more? There's more? Um, you have more. You have one. Yeah. Five more. Oh my god, five more. <laughs> Time's Shit. up. Ah, sorry. Oh, God, you got to say countries. Sam couldn't think I of couldn't a country. I couldn't think of a country. It's true. <laughs> ones that you missed are India, which has been, oh, yeah, had cloud totally. seeding programs Gosh. since the 1950s. And it's some of the, like, the longest and biggest programs in Southeast Asia. You missed Israel. I don't know. They're on Israel 4, randomized seeding experiment. So it's definitely been going for for quite a bit, at least at since least 1975. Uh-huh. Yeah, at least four experiments since for, for decades. You missed Thailand, which I thought was interesting. Mm. It was a project initiated in November 1955 called the Thailand Royal Rainmaking Project. And they have a Department (laughs) of Royal Rainmaking and Agricultural Aviation. Cool. And then Bulgaria, they have a hail suppression agency uh, that protects regions of farmland from hail crops. And you missed Australia. Oh, does it work? So scientists are mixed on it, but it works enough and consistently enough that a lot of people are researching it and like Hmm. looking into it. China was interesting because they used it before the Beijing Olympics to make sure it was clear on the first day of them. Uh So that worked because there wasn't rain in their like giant stadium. But I think the biggest problems that people are wondering about are making it work consistently or like in a meaningful way way because you can make it rain by spraying condensation nuclei into the sky but at what pollution cost Mm -hmm. or does it have enough water to like significantly change farmland or crops or anything like does it really increase the water that much and effects on other countries too so if you like create clouds and then those clouds fly over to a different country and then mess up their weather system Mm -hmm. what do you do about that so you got five, and then you missed five. So we, if we all just, got five if points. If we just named the biggest countries by land area, we would have gotten seven. <laughs> yeah, but I couldn't remember what they were. I said all the countries I knew, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Sam knows three countries. Yeah. <laughs> Next up, we're going to take a short break, and then it'll be time for the fact off. Welcome back, everybody. Here are our scores. We got me and Sam tied with 11, because that's how that game worked, <laughs> and Sari with 10. But you should honestly have 12 after that parody song. Not too bad. You don't. And now it's time for the fact off. Sam and I have both brought science facts to present to Sari an attempt to blow her mind. And Sari has points uh, that she can award to the fact that she likes the most, and it will decide... The winner of the episode, I can tell by where we're at right now. But to decide who goes first, Sari has a trivia question for us to answer. Grapple is sometimes called soft hail or snow pellets, but it isn't really hail and it isn't really snow. It's super cooled water droplets that freeze onto snowflakes to form tiny balls of rime ice. Mm. So Hmm. how cold can these super cooled water droplets be before they freeze? I will say... Negative 10 degrees Celsius. Oh, I'll say lower than that. I'll say negative 15 degrees Celsius. The answer is a negative 48.3 degrees Celsius. Why doesn't that water freeze like at a normal freezing temperature? It's so clean. There's no nucleation site. So if you've got Mm, extra, extra clean air and just water floating around, then it can get very cold. Until a snowflake nice. shows up and there's a nucleation site, so then it gloms right. on and freezes. Like, in the same way where you can put in a water bottle into the freezer and it can oh, become yeah. super cooled without being ice. Um, I guess I'll go first. 
So in 2021, we have all kinds of computer models and electronic instruments to tell us many days in advance when bad weather is coming. And this lets people like board up windows or build sandbag embankments and take lots of other precautions to minimize the loss of life and property damage that a big storm can cause. But in England in the year 1850, they were mostly still relying on a combination of folk knowledge and telegraphs from places that were currently experiencing storms. So this meant that storms could pretty much come out of nowhere and if you were in one of the like coastal towns that was supposed to send the telegraph, if you were in a storm, you were already in a storm. So there wasn't really that much you could do about it. And England was also losing ships at sea to storms because there wasn't really any way to communicate what the weather was like on the ocean. So this combination of problems set the stage for the invention of weather forecasting. And a footnote in that process is Dr. George Merriweather and a bunch of leeches. While doctors at the time didn't necessarily believe in balancing humors, they still practiced bloodletting. And uh, it was like a treatment for basically any disease you could think of at the time, I think. And they loved to use leeches to do bloodletting. So they had big jars of leeches sitting around doctor's offices, basically. So Dr. Merriweather spent a lot of time with leeches and noticed that his leeches got all worked up when bad weather was on its way. And they would like writhe around and climb up the sides of the jars and just like flip out. And from a modern lens, people think that possibly what was happening was that leeches can sense drops in pressure from a coming storm, which means that rain is coming and that they can travel farther than they could otherwise in their search for blood. But inspired by this observation and a poem by Edward Jenner, who was a scientist whose work also helped popularize the smallpox vaccine. The poem was about how animals react to coming rainstorms because like animal instinct was also a big new discovery that they were trying to figure out. The poem featured the line, the leech disturbed is newly risen quite to the summit of his prison. I don't really know what that means, but to Dr. <laughs> Merriweather, it meant that he should spend several months putting together an idea for a new type of weather prediction device that used leeches. I also think there were lots of types of barometers that existed at this point that also detected atmospheric pressure. So he was sort of reinventing mm -hmm. the wheel, but with leeches. I don't think he knew that, though. <laughs> he didn't, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So anyway, he came up with 12 corked glass jars were placed in a big circle at the base of this contraption, uh, and some water and a leech were placed in each one. He wrote that he used glass jars to prevent the affliction of solitary confinement in the leeches, aka so they wouldn't be lonely, so they could see each other and be like, hey, leech. <laughs> So each jar had a string through the cork and uh, into the bottle. And the other end of the string was tied to a bell hammer positioned by a big bell that was in the middle of the jars, like on a big pedestal. And he called his invention the Tempest Prognosticator. So the idea was that when the weather got bad, the leeches would start to freak out and climb up the walls of the bottle to go blood hunting, I guess. And they would move the string and ring the bell. So the more ringing there was, the worse the weather was coming was his idea. So he did a right. bunch of these tests through the 1850s and he had maybe some possibly successful results. He would send predictions out to different like scientific organizations around the country and at least one of them wrote him back a letter that said that he had successfully predicted a storm by up to 12 hours but i don't know how many letters he sent out so he maybe just got lucky <laughs> it's false positive yeah so he thought his invention could save lives and he wrote letters to the government asking them to adopt the prognosticator as the official storm detecting device of the navy uh, and he made a really ornate version of it and showed it off at the great exhibition in 1851 uh, hoping to sell them to rich people. But as far as anybody knows, nobody ever bought a single one, probably because you had to change the water and feed the leeches, and also they were full of leeches. And, uh, <laughs> he didn't get a government contract either. The Navy <clears throat> tested. They think the Navy tested the prognosticator, but they ended up going with the storm glass, which was a device championed by Admiral Robert Fitzroy. Uh, and the storm glass basically was just a bottle of mineral water, and it definitely didn't work. So they might have been better off going with the leeches that made Maybe worked a little bit. I, I love the idea of a of any science that at its core isn't actually a science. It's just a clever animal. <laughs> yeah. And so you just like build this beautiful device around a, like oh. twelve leeches yeah, or whatever. Gross little worms. And the only <laughs> thing that's happening is a leech is moving. You're harnessing the raw power of animal instinct. That's what he thought you were exactly. Doing. It's like the, the Flintstones. Like in the Flintstones, that's what everything was. Yeah. It's like your the remote control for your television was just a bird, bird that come out like the flew end of it. and turned the, the 
TV but it's on. also kind of like if the Flintstones lived in a world where there were already TV remote controls and then they built the remote control that the bird yeah. flew out of and they didn't know <laughs> that they were doing the same thing. <laughs> and he did really make a beautiful thing. We'll put a picture of it on, in the show notes. You can just type in Tempest Prognosticator mm. on Google also because like nobody's ever named anything else that <laughs> since then. I also, while I was looking this up, saw a bunch of pictures of leeches and I was like, you know, they're kind like a leech can be a little bit beautiful, like snake skin Mm -hmm. patterns and like lots of contrast. And then it's like, ah, that freaking head. Pretty bad. (laughs) All right. You guys want to hear my fact? Yeah. Yeah. It is in a similar vein because uh, the way that we determine what the weather is. Uh, is really important to us. And we have, it has evolved a lot over the years since the Tempest Prognosticator. Mm -hmm. And it has been kind of surprisingly messed up by COVID and maybe not Mm -hmm. in the way that you would expect. One of the things that was important to do and that uh, has continued to happen over the last too long now since March is that uh, planes are not flying as much anymore. And that has messed up weather forecasts which is a wild thing to me that I never would have expected. And it turns out that every commercial aircraft since uh, like the 1970s is part of a like worldwide network of weather data collection what? called the Aircraft Meteorological Data Relay Report. All of these aircrafts constantly collect data. So a 3,500 aircrafts flown by more than 40 airlines globally. They take temperature and wind measurements uh, every few seconds during takeoff and landing and every few minutes while the plane is at cruising altitude. And so something like 680,000 observations are sent into this every day if there isn't a pandemic. But starting in February, the number of flights dropped uh, 50 to 75 percent, depending on the month. And that, in turn, led to a lot fewer of these AMDAR reports. So a scientist named Jing Chen at Lancaster Environmental Center in the UK decided to see how this reduction in data affected meteorological forecasts from March until May. And he found that, in general, weather forecasts have worsened more in the Northern Hemisphere, which is where you usually get more aircraft data than in non-COVID times, because that's where most of the land is and also most of the rich people. In particular, accuracy of surface temperature forecasts was off by as much as two degrees Celsius in Greenland and Siberia, because those are locations that are more remote and they don't have as many like conventional meteorological stations. So airplanes are the, like the majority of the data they get or a lot of the data they get. Other places with a lot of air travel like North America and Southeast China and Australia, so places where there were lots of planes, a density of planes, they also experienced worse forecasts. But one area that didn't do that badly was Western Europe, which just has a really extensive network of meteorological stations on the ground Mm -hmm. that were able to provide the data to compensate for the loss of this AMDAR network that provides just a tremendous amount of data that we kind of just stopped getting for a while. Yeah, I never thought about the fact that planes could have useful instruments on them besides, like, carrying people. But it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're going to use all this fuel to get people from place to place, you might as well get as much utility out of that as possible. Yeah. And this goes back a long, long way. Uh, This first happened like when pilots first started happening, basically. So the Weather Bureau would pay pilots in 1919, they started doing this, to fly with little things called aerometeorographs. That would be attached to the plane's wings, and you'd get a 10% bonus for every 1,000 feet you flew over 13,000 feet. Oh. Do they still get bonuses, or is it just something they do? I don't the- think so. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> but I love the idea that you just get paid to fly because the weather people are like, holy crap, <laughs> you can find out what the weather's like up there? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. So, Sarah, you've either got Sam's fact that Dr. George Merriweather, I can't believe his name was Merriweather, oh. invented the Tempest Prognosticator to try and forecast storms using leeches, or my fact that COVID is affecting weather forecasting because less commercial planes are flying and we're not getting all of that good AMDAR data. It's harder and I have to do it by myself. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to give <laughs> is. Sam three points and Hank two points because... Ah. I didn't know about either of these things before. And even though Amdar is going to change how I view plane travel, Mm -hmm. I love the leeches. And I would love (laughs) to, like, find an old leech machine and restore it and just have it as, like, 
This is my leech machine. And now it's time for Ask the Science Couch, where we've got some listener questions for our couch of finely honed scientific minds. This is from at gingersnap273. Is acid rain a real thing I should actually be concerned about? Uh, yeah, but less so, right? And it's bad for buildings and not necessarily as bad for people, right? Is that the thing? Well, it's bad for people in that it's bad for forests. Mm. But, like, you don't have to be worried about it. You don't have to be worried about, like, getting your face melted off by a a rain. Yeah, so there's different amounts of acidity. It's all based on the pH scale, which you've probably heard about if you've ever taken a chemistry class, which I'm sure people who have listened to SciShow Tangents have or are going to at some point in their life because they're a bunch of nerds. Uh, But lower (laughs) numbers on the pH scale are more acidic and higher numbers are more basic. So seven is neutral, pure water. All rain is slightly acidic because there's carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and that dissolves in the water to make carbonic acid, sort of like how our blood is slightly acidic. Rain is usually around a pH of about 5.6. And acid rain is more acidic than that. It's a pH of about 4 instead of 5.6. And based on the way the pH scale works, that's a like a 10 times difference. It's a logarithmic mm-hmm. related scale. And it's caused naturally by things like volcanoes erupting or decay of vegetation, but also things that we do as humans, like power plants that release gases or cars that release emissions, particularly gases like sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides lower the pH of rain. It can neutralize materials that can be washed away by acid rain. So that's why like certain stones, the acid will react with the minerals and Mm -hmm. neutralize, but then wear away at the building material. Four is like less acidic than orange juice. Uh, Yeah. So like... Okay. Orange juice won't melt you. Yeah. You could put orange juice on your face, but you wouldn't want to put it in your eyes. It wouldn't hurt them, but it might hurt, Mm -hmm. you know? But it is enough to harm things like insects or fish whose skin is less protective against water. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, acid rain was like, the scariest thing. Like in the 90s, mm-hmm. you'd hear about it all the time. So what happened to it? Do we just get like, that's eh, going to happen. We can't do anything about it. No, uh, we uh, created really pretty tight regulations on the emission of sulfur dioxide from coal plants, mm-hmm. which is the primary place that sulfur dioxide was coming from. Mm-hmm. So we cr- created a cap and trade scheme where it was like, you, you basically can only release a certain amount. And if you release more than that, you have to buy it from a different power plant that has figured out how to filter out or scrub out the sulfur dioxide. And that was extremely effective in lowering sulfur dioxide, which actually did a really good job of decreasing the amount of acid rain in America. Wow. A policy was happened. Yeah, it worked. (laughs) Cool. Yeah. Regulations. (laughs) Turns out we can combat climate change and like the the effects we're having if we... (laughs) In yeah, policy. If we if we try hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was expensive for the coal coal plants and they didn't want to do it. And then they did it and we're okay. That in the hole in the ozone layer. We also fixed that. I mean we didn't fix it, but it's better. If you want to ask the science couch your question, you can follow us on Twitter at SciShow Tangents, where we tweet out our topics for upcoming episodes every week. Thank you to at Neon Molly, at Space Hikes, and everybody else who tweeted us your questions for this episode. Final scores! Sari with 10, Hank with 13, and Sam with 14, right. which means, Sam, you get another chin coin. Oh, I already had one? I think so, yeah. Oh. So you got two, and I've got one, and Sari's got none. Oh, no. If you like this show and you want to help help us out, it's very easy to do that. You can leave us a review wherever you listen. That's helpful, and it helps us know what you like about the show. You can also tweet us people you might think would be good guests for SciShow Tangents, because we're thinking about having more guests in the future. Or you can tweet out your favorite moment from the episode. Finally, if you want to show your love for SciShow Tangents, you can just tell, tell people, people about, about us. us. Thank you for joining us. I've been Hank Green. I've been Sari Riley. And I've been Sam Schultz. SciShow Tangents is created by all of us and produced by Caitlin Hoffmeister and Sam Schultz, who edits a lot of these episodes along with Hiroko Matsushima. Our social media organizer is Paolo Garcia Prieto. Our editorial assistant is Dabuki Chakravarti. Our sound design is by Joseph Tuna Medish. And we couldn't make any of this without our patrons on Patreon. Thank you. And remember, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be lighted. But one more thing. 
Trees have to be pretty strong to contend with extreme weather since they can't really like escape or hide from it because they're stuck outside in the ground. One of the mm-hmm. things that can impact their resilience is butt rot, a disease caused by fungi that eat away at the butt of the tree, which is where the trunk gets a little bit thicker at the bottom and intersects with the ground, which apparently is like the like secret weak spot of trees. Mm-hmm. From the outside, the trees don't show any sign of butt rot, but they rot away on the inside, <laughs> making them weaker and prone to topple over in bad weather. And everybody knows that the, the a tree's butt is on the inside. Mm-hmm. Every science is worth its salt. If ever we uh, do a, a conference again and we if 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 we do like a signing line or something, I want that to be the secret code what? that people will be like, where's the tree's butt <laughs> on the inside? Yeah. <laughs> we need a super fan <laughs> chant of some sort. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 